Warning, this podcast contains descriptions of murder, torture and abuse. As a result, it may not be suitable for everybody. Southampton, England. Southampton is a city in Hampshire, South East England, 70 miles southwest of London and 50 miles northwest of Portsmouth. This episode of Hometown Murder Cases consists of Teresa Eleanor de Simon. She was murdered in Southampton in England 1979. Her murder led to one of the longest proven cases of miscarriages of justice in English legal history. The second case is Hannah Foster, who was a 70-year-old British student who had been abducted after a night out in Southampton in mid-March 2003. The last case is Ellen Isabella Ronnie Gibson, the actress known professionally as Gay Gibson, who went missing during the sailing of a boat between Cape Town in South Africa and Southampton, England in October 1947. So thank you for listening um, to Home Time Murders as ever. We really do appreciate it. This is the last episode in season one of Hotel Murders. So episode 25. Um, we're going to take a short break, uh, which is going to be October. And then the, uh, the first Monday of November will be the uh, the first episode of season two of Hometown Murders. That's going to be on the 2nd of November 2020. Look out for that. If you want any further information, then find us on social media. It's at Hometown Murders. That's Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We've also got our YouTube channel at Hometown Murders as well. So easily found. Just go finding further information. And in that meantime, during that break, we're working on a second podcast to be released again the 2nd of November um, further information will follow it's going to be called the Mind Blown History Podcast, it's going to be a short 5 minute podcast um, there's going to be 2 every week and it's going to have Mind Blown History stuff you don't learn it here at school it's going to be weird, it's going to be made up or seem it's going to be made up or ridiculous but actually it's real history facts that are too good to be true so look out for that one. The first case we're looking for hometown murders is Teresa Eleanor de Sima. She was murdered in Southampton in 1979 and as previously said, led to one of the longest proven cases of miscarriages of justice in legal history. Sean Hodgson, uh, 27 years in prison before his DNA was analysed and he was exonerated and it was shown that it could not have come from him. Now, as a result of Hodgson's appeal, Operation Iceberg was created by the Criminal Cases Review Commission with the aim of using DNA evidence in pre-1990 rape or murder cases. This led to the review of 240 other convictions. They requested that the Crown Prosecution Service identify and review similar murder cases from the time before DNA testing was available. It sent September 2009 on the basis of DNA evidence from exhumed body, police named David Lace as the likely killer. Lace, who was 17 at the time of the murder, had confessed to police in 1983 that he had raped and killed De Simon, but officers refused to believe him. Lace committed suicide in December 1988. On the 27th of October 2012, three years after his release, Sean Hodgson died from emphysema. On the evening of the 4th of December 1979, 22-year-old Teresa De Simon had been working as a part-time barmaid in the Tom Tackle Public House in Commercial Road, Southampton. By the day, she was employed as a full-time clerk for the Southern Gas Board. She had been employed at the pub for less than a month, working two evenings each week, partly to widen her social circle and partly to supplement her income to pay for her Ford Escort car that she bought three months previously. 
The pub was located centrally in the city, only 50 yards from the police station and law courts and near the city's central train station and the Gormont Theatre, which is now the Mayflower. When her shift at the Tom Tackle ended at 11pm, she went to a nightclub in nearby London Road in the company of her friend Jenny Savage. Although the discotheque was relatively a short distance from the public house, they travelled in Savage's car, leaving De Simon's Ford Escort in the pub car park. While at the discotheque, De Simon and Savage were together throughout the evening and De Simon did not consume any alcoholic drinks. They left the nightclub together and Savage drove De Simon back to the Tum Tackle car park, arriving sometime between 12.30 and 1am on the 5th of September. Savage testified that she drove into the covered parking area and they sat chatting for a while before De Simon made the short walk to her car, at which point Savage reversed out and drove away from the scene. Savage was the last witness to see De Simon before she was killed. When De Simon's mother, Mary Sedetti, discovered she had not returned home by the morning, she expressed concern and her husband Michael, Teresa's stepfather, drove to the pub where he observed De Simon's car still parked but did not make any closer investigation. Shortly after 10am, Anthony Pocock, The landlord of the Tom Tackle was expecting a commercial delivery to the premises, believing De Simon had deliberately left the car overnight. He tried to move it to allow the delivery through. Inside, he found De Simon's partially clothed body on the back seat. He immediately called the police. The pathologist arrived at the scene at 11.45 a.m. His report of the crime scene described the deceased lying on her back with her legs bent at the knee and thigh with the knee resting against the back of the seat and the left thigh running along the edge of the seat with the leg hanging over the edge. The body was naked from the waist down and her left breast was exposed. Part of a pair of tights were pulled down to the left ankle. The remainder of her underwear and the other part of her tights were found in the passenger well. The time of death was placed at between 1 and 2 a.m. on the 5th of December. In a statement issued at the time, Detective Superintendent John Porter said, quote, It is 99% certain that the girl was murdered, attacked, chatted to or met by a killer in a matter of seconds after Jenny Savage left her. He could have been waiting and seen Jenny leave. It is possible that he was actually sitting in Teresa's car as we found the near side passenger door unlocked, end quote. The pathologist determined based on the presence of white frothy mucus in the victim's mouth that the cause of death was a long, slow strangulation. Visible on De Simon's neck was a series of multiple roughly horizontal linear bruised abrasions on the front of her neck which matched the description of a gold chain and crucifix which the deceased had said to be wearing that evening indicating the possibility it had been used as a ligature and leading to the tabloid press dubbing the murderer as the crucifix killer. The chain was not present when the body was discovered and has never been recovered. Semen was presented in the virginal canal in the sufficient concentration to indicate it had been present no more than three or four hours before death. As De Simon's movements for the entire evening previous to her death was known and documented, the semen could only have come from her assailant. Evidence of bruising and tearing of the genitalia demonstrated that intercourse was non-consensual. A number of virginal, anal, oral and control swabs were taken by the pathologist and subsequent forensic examination demonstrated the semen was produced by a male with the blood type A or AB. Further swabs were taken from De Simon's car and the clothing. The victim's handbag and personal belongings, including a diary, were found in multiple locations within the vicinity of the crime scene although her car keys, rotary wristwatch, two necklaces, rings and a bracelet has never been recovered. 
The investigation was headed by Detective Superintendent John Porter of Southampton Criminal Investigation Department. In 12 months after the murder, police interviewed 30,000 people, took 2,500 statements and traced 500 people who were in the area in the night of the murder. At one point, the list of possible suspects totaled 300 men. Despite De Simon's possessions being taken, police did not believe that robbery had been the motive. They were convinced that a real, it was a red herring and she was the victim of a vicious rape by a brutal and merciless killer. Police received two anomalous letters, postmarked 12th and 27th of December in Southampton, which gave information regarding the location of the killer. The writer was never identified and the eventual arrest of Hodgson led police to miss, dismiss this as a hoax at the time of the trial. Nine months after the murder, while Hodgson was already in custody for an unrelated offence, two anonymous telephone calls were made to the police in which the caller confessed to killing De Simon. Porter released a statement to the Southern Echo at a time in which he said the calls came from a man who said that he committed the murder. He gave the impression he was under severe strain and was asking for help and advice. From the nature of his conversation, we think that it is possible that the cause could be genuine. The second case we're looking at today is the one of Hannah Foster. She was abducted and killed on a night out in Southampton in March 2003. She was just 17 years old. She was born the 31st of August 1985 and was an A-level student who had been preparing to study medicine at university. She lived with her parents, Hilary and Trevor, and younger sisters, Sarah, in Southampton. On the 14th of March, 2003, she went out socialising with a friend in downtown Southampton, visiting both The Hobbit and Nearbo Sobar. At around 10.50pm, her friend caught a bus home on Portswood Road, while Foster decides to walk the half mile to her home alone. A sandwich delivery man, Meninda Par Singh Kohli had been drinking in the area. While driving home in a company van, he noticed Foster alone on the darkened streets and abducted her as she passed his parked vehicle. Foster's parents noticed she had not come home at around 5am the next morning and by 10.30am the police were informed of her disappearance. Initial investigation focused on her period, prepaid period mobile phone in which was still active and was able to trace her movements using signal tower records. In Portsmouth at a recycling centre, her phone and bag was found dumped in a bottle recycled bin. On the 16th of March, Foster's body was found dumped in bushes on Allington Road, the West End, just outside Southampton. A post-mortem examination revealed she'd been raped and strangled, but the semen found on her clothing could not be matched to anyone on the database. Investigators also traced her phone calls. Unknown to Coley, while driving south along the M27, Foster secretly made a 999 call to emergency services around 11 p.m. in the hope they would realize she was in trouble. However, as there was no direct communication with the operator and as the voices were indistinct, the call was treated as a probable misdial and forwarded to Silent Solutions, a two minute long recording message telling people in need of assistance to dial 55. Investigators then enhanced the recording and was able to learn that Foster was in the back of a van being driven by a man with a South Asian accent. After identifying seven vans on CCTV footage that might fit the route taken, a public appeal for information was made by the parents on the 27th of March via Crime Watch. A supervisor at Hazelwood Foods identified Coley, one of the company's drivers, as a possible suspect. He had taken a van home that night as he did not own his own vehicle, had a similar delivery route, had a fresh scratch on his face and was unable to complete his shift the next day. 
Investigators noting the same van on their shortlist soon found blood and semen in the vehicle and retraced its route in and around Southampton, the M27, Portsmouth and the recycling centre. Now identified by investigators as the prime suspect, it was soon realised that Coley had already travelled from Heathrow to Delhi on the 18th of March, ostensibly to visit his comatose mother. Finding his home vacated, they also interviewed his wife and took a DNA sample from one of his two sons. Coley's wife, a UK citizen, and his brother, a policeman in India, however, denied his involvement in the murder. The case stored for the next 15 months after Indian police were not able to prioritise the crime and media attention was low. On the 10th of July 2004, however, Foster's parents went to Chandra themselves and made a public appeal for information of his whereabouts. During their 10-day visit, the Fosters heard a series of press conferences as well as opening a telephone hotline. Their visit soon became a subject of high national wide interest in the Indian press. Hampshire Police, in conjunction with the Sun, announced a award of 5 million rupees to anyone whose information led to the arrest of Kohli. On the 15th of July, after a number of tip-offs, Kohli was arrested by an off-duty policeman in West Bengal's Darjeeling district, where he'd been working under an alias for the Red Cross while trying to board a bus from Chalingpong to Nepal where his new wife. While in custody, Kohli stated he was tired of running. On the 28th of July, Kohli admitted to raping and murdering Foster in an interview with a private television channel and said that he was forced to kill Foster after raping her because she refused not to report his crime. In August 2004, he retracted his statement saying, it was not my own will. Kohli was held in judicial custody in New Delhi, pending extradition to the United Kingdom, and the case underwent 100 court proceedings and 35 appeals. After three years of wrangling, a final decision to extradite him to the UK was handed down on the 8th of June 2007. On the 28th of July, Coley arrived at Heathrow and was arrested and charged with the murder, kidnap and rape of Foster. He was also charged with the manslaughter, false imprisonment and perverting the course of justice. On the 10th of December 2007, Coley entered a plea of not guilty to the charges at Winchester Court. Coley initially argued he simply found someone had broken into his van and dumped Forrester's body there, causing him to panic. He later argued after DNA evidence was produced that criminals had forced him to rape and murder Foster. On the 25th of November 2008, Coley, then aged 41, was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommended minimal term of 24 years, two years less for time already served in the UK on remand. Foster's family expressed their disappointment in the sentence, hoping that the killer would spend the rest of his life in prison. Under trial judge's recommendation, Coley is expected to remain in prison until at least 2030 and the age of 63. And the last case we're looking at is the murder of Gay Gibson. She was born Elaine Isabella Ronnie Gibson on the 16th of June 1926. Known professionally as Gay Gibson, and was an actress who went missing during a sailing trip on a board a ship between Cape Town in South Africa and Southampton, England. The case was known as the Porthole Murder and the convicted was James Cam, who acknowledged pushing Gibson's body through the ship's porthole, which was a beastly thing to do. He strenuously denied having killed her insisting that he'd either choked or suffocated while two of them were in bed together. Cam was convicted of Gibson's murder and was sentenced to death by hanging, but a legal move to suspend the death penalty for all crimes in Britain meant he served 11 years in jail for the crime. He denied killing her for the rest of his life. The case attracted widespread attention at the time, drawing parallels to the Fuel Noir and Agatha Christie novels. 
even Winston Churchill commented on the outcome of the case, stating his regret that the punishment of Cram had been commuted to a lesser sentence. Eileen Isabella Ronnie Gay Gibson was a 21-year-old, an actress who was travelling from England on the Union Castle Line ship MV Durban Castle in October 1947. Gay Gibson was her stage name and she'd been on a third theatre tour in South Africa with Doreen Mantle. Gibson was returning to London where she was living to perform in theatre at the West End. Her presence on board came to the attention of James Cam, who was born December 1916, a 30-year-old steward on the liner. Gibson had been accommodated in cabin 12C, B deck, which was in first class. Cam was seen associating with Gibson, which was against company regulations, as he'd been remanded over this by a senior officer. The ship set sail on the 10th of October, and on the 17th, after a night of dancing, she was extorted home by two friends at 11.30 p.m. Sometime around 3 a.m. the following morning, the deputy watchman, a man named Frederick Steer, was awakened by a summons which had been activated from cabin 126. When he arrived at the cabin, he was noted that two lights were lit outside Gibson's cabin, one red and one green. One light indicated that the duty steward had been called, while the other meant that the duty stewardess had also been requested. Stearson thought this strange, as usually one person would be summoned. Steers' knock on the door was answered by Cam, who only half opened the door and informed him that everything was all right. The duty watchman left as he assumed that a deck steward, Cam, had arrived before him to help the passenger. In the morning, the female steward for Gibson's deck, Eileen Field, came to clean her room. She noticed the bunk was empty, stains on the sheets and the porthole was open. Later, the officer in command of the ship, Captain Patey, interviewed Cam, who initially denied any involvement in Gibson's disappearance. When told that a duty watchman saw him at the door, Cam relented and told him a story that neither the captain nor the ship's doctor could believe. Cam stated that during sexual intercourse, Gibson had died and in a fit of abject panic because he stood to lose his job and family, Cam pushed Gibson through the porthole. At the time, the ship was 90 miles off the coast of West Africa, heading north. Captain Patey ordered the ship to turn around and scour the water for Gibson's body. Patey also contacted the Union Castle Line offices in London, asking for the ship to be met by police when it arrived in Southampton due to complications. A return cable was sent to Patey, instructing him to padlock and seal off the room, disturbing nothing. When the ship docked at Cowles Roads in Southampton, Police officers were waiting to question Cam, who had been confined to his cabin by the ship's crew. Southampton Police was assisted by the Metropolitan Police on the case, and forensic evidence was later examined at Metropolitan Police Laboratory at Hendon. This was not uncommon at the time. The Southampton Police Force was quite small, so they asked for help from Scotland Yard. The police in the United Kingdom were involved even as the murder took place off the coast of West Africa. It was the British ship under British authority, so the prosecution was brought by British authorities. On Monday the 27th of October 1947, the Southern Daily Echo reported that James Cam, a deck steward from Durban Castle, had been remanded in custody and charged with murder on the high seas. The trial in Westchester was an unusual one since it was labelled by some as the first case in English law whereby a prosecution was sought without a victim's body. This had been pointed out to be untrue as there was a case 13 years earlier when a father, Thomas Davidson, was convicted of murdering his son, John, even further back as the Camden Wonder case. The case also gained some interest due to a mirroring in plot of a crime novel. Richard Leto described the story as having all the hallmarks of an Agatha Christie piece, a young actress, a Justin steward, romance and a suspicious death on the high seas. 
During the trial, it was revealed that pathologist Dennis Hocklin had discovered a urine stain on the sheets from cabin 126. It was stated by the Crown pathologist that involuntary urination is sometimes occurred during strangulation. Hocklin argued that it could have been result of natural causes. The contents, walls and portal section from cabin 126 on the Durban Castle was removed by police and used as the exhibits in the court case. When Cam took the stand, the prosecution barrister asked if he considered himself an honest man. Cam replied, quote, I think so, sir, end quote. It was then proven in court that Cam had changed his story six times in what Cam defended as self-preservation. When asked about pushing Gibson's body through the porthole, Cam acknowledged it was beastly conduct. After a four-day hearing, the jury deliberated for 45 minutes and returned with a guilty verdict. Cam was sentenced to death by Justice Hilbury on the 22nd of March 1948. However, the execution was not carried out because Parliament was considering the abolition of death penalty at the time and the Home Secretary commuted all pending death sentences while the matter was discussed. This prompted Winston Churchill to come up that the House of Commons has, by its vote, saved the life of a brutal, lascivious murderer who thrust the poor girl he had raped and assaulted through the portal to the sharks. An appeal was lodged and heard in April 1948, but was denied. Cam was released from prison in 1959, but was recalled to prison after being convicted of a number of indecent assaults of young girls. He was released again in 1978. He died in July 1979 from heart failure. Eileen Gibson's body was never recovered. Thank you for everybody who's listened to this episode. This episode has been researched, written and hosted by me, Andrew Knight. Sound, music and editing has been provided by Harry Edmondson. Make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere where you listen to your podcast. This allows the episode to be downloaded automatically as soon as it's released. Please reach out to us on the social media. We're at Hometown Murders on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Please support the show by leaving a five-star rating or a review. It really does help 